So uh, I'm going to give you a very high level overview of the consequences of any drug antibodies and then talk to you about different routes of exposure, um, not so much on their impact on immunogenicity, but just a, um, an overview of different routes of exposure, and then some case studies uh, about how various routes of exposures have impacted immunogenicity. So the first issue is what are the consequences of immunogenicity? Why do we care about this topic at all? And the answer is that um, immunogenicity to therapeutic proteins has impacted uh, clinical development and safety and efficacy of therapeutic proteins. So our first clinical concern is, of course, safety, and that is because uh, antibody, anti-drug antibodies to therapeutic proteins have been found to neutralize the activity of endogenous proteins, and if that protein has a unique function, um, patients may develop deficiency syndrome that can have long-lasting impact on their health. Uh, Antidrug antibodies have also been found to cause various types of hypersensitivity reactions, including anaphylaxis, uh, infusion-related reactions, uh, and other types of, of hypersensitivity reactions. Antidrug antibodies may also impact the efficacy of a therapeutic protein, and in this, in this context, antidrug antibodies may either enhance or decrease its efficacy, either by changing exposure or changing the biodistribution of the product, and um, by the same, under, using the same um, um, mechanism, they may also impact both the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the product. And um, for the most part, though, what we've seen is that antidrug antibodies actually don't have any discernible impact on therapeutic proteins. So because of the potential for uh, the impact of antidrug antibodies, we re FDA requests that uh, all sponsors manage the immunogenicity of the therapeutic protein. And Im immunogenicity management has at least two components to it. Uh, one is a risk assessment and the other is risk mitigation. <coughs> so for assessing the risk of immunogenicity, um, the, f the first thing that we're going to think of is the severity of, con of consequences of antidrug antibodies or the, the harm they may cause. And this is a standard component of any risk assessment program. Uh, we consider that any product that to be high risk, if the consequences of any drug antibodies could be severe, even though the likelihood or incidence is extremely low. So two examples of this would be pure red cell aplasia that is seen with erythropoietin. And this is a situation in which any drug antibodies against erythropoietin uh, block the or neutralize the clinical uh, activity of erythropoietin, causing a profound um, um, anemia. We have also seen um, severe pharmacytopenia uh, in patients treated with, or actually these are healthy human subjects primarily, that were treated with titillated megatereocyte growth and, develop and development factor. And in some of those patients, the thrombocytopenia lasted for several years and required treatment with immunosuppressive agents and, and transfusions. So there have been a number of incidents uh, in which the consequences of antidrug antibodies were extremely severe to patients, even though the incidence was quite low. The other component of an immunogenicity risk assessment is the incidence of, of antidrug antibody formation, uh, and that would just be um, looking at how, how frequently they occur in the population. And finally, we look at the detectability of antidrug antibodies using um, uh, assays and whether or not we can develop good assays to detect antidrug antibodies. And all these are components of an immunogenicity risk assessment. And right now for today, we're not going to talk at all about the potential harm of antidrug antibodies. This is having to do with the detectability, but we will be talking about the incidence of APA <coughs> or predicting the likelihood that antidrug antibodies will occur. So there's a number of components, again, that go into predicting the likelihood of antidrug antibodies occurring, and that does include product derivation, product-specific attributes, patient-specific attributes, and trial-defined attributes. By product derivation, we mean whether or not the product is um, has an endogenous human counterpart or is actually a, a protein that's foreign to humans. Uh, product-specific attributes include things like is it glycosylated, oxidized? What is the intrinsic activity of the, of the product? 
patient-specific attributes include things such as the, pa the patient's immune status, their age, their gender, um, genetics of the patient, genetics of the disease that they have, and then trial design specific attributes I will go into a little bit more later on. Uh, in the talk today, I'm really not going to talk about product derivation or product specific attributes or even patient specific attributes, and I'm going to focus on a small component of trial design attributes. There is a quite a bit of literature out there uh, that talks about these other, um, these other factors and how they could impact the likelihood of immunogenicity uh, if you're working on models to predict immunogenicity. So as far as trial design specific factors are concerned, we, um, the one I'm going to focus on today, of course, is the route of delivery if it's oral, intravenous, intramuscular, inhaled, or subcutaneous. Um, other aspects that may also impact uh, the, uh, or other trial design aspects that may impact immunogenicity would be the dose and frequency of, of administration, whether this is a one-time administration or a few doses or you're going to have chronic administration, what concomitant medications you're on uh, can impact immunogenicity. So we've seen that patients who are on other immunosuppressive therapies tend to have lower incidence of antibody antibody. And also the point in drug development may also um, impact the trial design and immunogenicity. For example, uh, so many uh, phase one or pharmacokinetic trials or studies are done in healthy human subjects. And uh, that may have very different uh, immunogenicity profile than in a specific disease population. Also, there may be uh, overlaps in overlapping factors such as early in development, uh, the manufacturing process may not be as uh, good as it would be later on in development. You might have higher levels of impurities that could Im increase immunogenicity, and those may actually be eliminated as the manufacturing process is refined and you get high, high product proteins that are high, more highly purified. So all of these factors, again, can have uh, in interplay that would have impact the immunogenicity or the ultimate immunogenicity of the product. And again, I'm not going to talk in detail about dose and frequency, chronic medications, or point in development, and I'm going to focus more on the route of delivery of anti-drug antibodies. So it's long been a paradigm that oral administration of anti-drug anti of therapeutic proteins is less immunogenic than IV, which is less immunogenic than IM is less immunogenic than inhaled, and with inhaled and subcutaneous um, being perhaps the most highly immunogenic routes of exposure and um, roughly equal. Uh, so the question is, is this paradigm correct? So when we're thinking about our risk assessment, how do we weight the route of exposure? Uh, and the answers, potential answers are, we're not too far off, it all depends, all of the above or none of the above. And the true answer is all of the above. This, isn't, this actually isn't too far off but it does depend on um, a variety of contextual um, parameters, and I will go into some of that with the case studies that I'll give in a little bit. So I'm going to give a high-level overview of some of these different routes of administration. And the first one is, um, and, or routes of exposure, and the first one is oral or inhaled. And if you're going to have an oral or inhaled drug, your exposure is going to be to the mucosal immune system. And this is a humongous immune system that includes things like the gastrointestinal tract, uh, the respiratory system, the urogenital tract, the eye conjunctiva, inner ears, ducts of the exocrine, exocrine gland, gland. And there's some very interesting um, features of the mucosal immune system that need to be taken into consideration when thinking about how mucosal roots of exposure uh, can impact in immunogenicity. And one of those factors is that the antigen may maintain locally high concentrations for periods of time. The challenge of the mucosal immune system is to maintain appropriate immune responses in the face of huge commensal microbial colonization. There's been an estimate of something like a thousand trillion microbes uh, in that, that interface with the mucosal immune system and covering about 4,000 different strains of microbes. In addition to uh, these commensal microbial exposure, you have exposure to foreign matter such as in food and particulates that you inhale. And the in mucosal immune system has to deal with these 
um, benign, relatively benign exposures in, this, it, in the face of also having to deal with the fact that most infections have a mucosal route of entry. Okay. So how does the immune system, how does the mucosal immune system do this? And it does this by being actually quite complex. The immune system has, the mucosal immune system has several components to it. One of them being a mechanical barrier that includes mucus, which flows and moves things around, and um, high epi and an epithelial membrane with high turnover um, that constantly keeps things moving um, through the, the immune system. And it has an extracellular barrier that is comprised of proteolytic enzymes, scavenger proteins, and antimicrobial peptides. So before um, a, a microbe actually gets all the way into the mucosal immune system or an antigen, it has to actually survive these two barriers. The mucosal immune system also has a very high density of cellular immune effectors. 80% um, of immune competent, or there's an estimation at least, that 80% of immune competent cells are in mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. The, immune, the mucosal immune system is also um, very compartmentalized, and it's this compartmentalization that also helps it maintain the balance between uh, a wanted immune response to infectious agents and unwanted immune responses to um, commensal bacteria, food antigens, etc. Um, immune, mucosal and lymphocytes preferentially traffic to mucosal lymphoid organs. If your route of exposure, for, and, and here's some examples of that, if your route of exposure is oral, the antibody response is primarily going to be in the small intestine and the ascending colon, stomach, mammary, and salivary glands. All routes of exposure are not particularly effective for eliciting antibody responses in the distal large intestine, tonsils, large, uh, sorry, lower airway mucosa, and the respiratory tract. On the other hand, if you have a nasal route of exposure, you're primarily going to see an antibody response in the upper airway, regional nasal and salivary secretions, and cervical genital mucosa. Another way the mucosal immune system maintains a balance is um, some complexity in other types of receptors <coughs> and immune modulatory molecules, such as the toll-like receptors, which can modulate homeostasis and responses to pathogenic microbes, as well as to luminal materials such as food. And so here's, um, I just exerted um, this study from Lizzo in from 2012, where he recorded that DNA motifs from probiotic bacteria such as Lactobacillus um, parasitii, suppress pro-inflammatory responses <coughs> in the lamin appropriate dendritic cells, the E. coli DNA, and promoted T. reg development. So you can see that, that there's a whole, there are layers of context that go into um, determining what type of immune response you may elicit uh, to any given antigen. Um, there's, I think many people here have heard um, talk about the fact that uh, there's been an increase in atopy or allergic type responses, and that may be due to dysregulation of the Th2 type responses of the immune system. And there's been a, a hypothesis sent around that's called a hygiene hypothesis that immunization has decreased uh, T helper 1 responses, leading to dysregulated T helper 2 responses. And these are um, types of responses um, that the immune system, or categories of responses of the immune system. Um, however, what we've seen is that helmet infection polarizes to Th2 and reduces atopy, which has led to something called the board IgE kind of hypothesis, that if you, if you deviate toward the Th2 uh, antigen response, which is generally supposed to be protective against helminth infections, and there's no helminth around, then what you'll get is a barren out allergic responses because both of those are modulated by, or moderated by uh, IgE. Uh, in contrast to that, we've also seen an increase in inflammatory bowel disease, which is a Th1 um, type response. And so you actually have to kind of balance increases in the population of both Th1 and Th2 types of responses. So there seems to be a potential for general types of dysregulation or increased dysregulation of regulatory activity in the mucosal immune system. And, and so this is, again, uh, a high level of complexity in trying to figure out uh, what, what the context of immune responses are and how various uh, features of our lives 
impact the types of immune responses that we're seeing. And all these types of all this type of complexity is things you need to think about when you're evaluating your risk assessment for groups of exposure. Now, if your exposure is subcutaneous, what you're going to be exposed to is the cutaneous immune system, and it has a lot of challenges that are similar to the mucosal <coughs> immune system. The antigen may maintain locally high concentrations for periods of time. Um, the challenge is, again, to maintain appropriate immune responses in the face of commensal microbial con con colonization. Um, and um, the, uh, the skin, actually, the cutaneous immune system, also has is vastly colonized um, with microbes. Also, like the mucosal immune system, the skin or the ep provides a mechanical barrier um, that is comprised of the epidermis. There's an extracellular barrier as well that has, includes proteolytic enzymes as, and antimicrobial peptides. And all of these are challenges that antigens and microbes need to face in order to penetrate into the skin. Um, there is also a high density of cellular cellular immune effector cells that include different types of antigen presenting cells such as longer Han cells, dermal dendritic cells. There are also uh, anti uh, effector cells in the skin such as T cells and there's about twice the amount of circulating T cells in, um, there are about twice the amount of T cells in the skin as in the circulation. There are other innate immune cells but interestingly there are no um, resonant B cells. Uh, the skin is a highly complex, um, uh, highly complex uh, system, and it's comprised of the epidermis and the dermis. And you can see in this cartoon um, the many layers that uh, an antigen needs to go through, and the different types of barriers that an antigen is exposed to and has to penetrate to get all the way through the epidermis. Um, and then it would go into the subcutaneous tissue, which is comprised of collagen fibrils and um, glycosaminoglycans, and um, it's a slightly acidic environment. So there is a lot for an antigen as well as a uh, microbe to uh, survive in order to get into the, the cutaneous em environment. Also, um, there are lymph, uh, lymph uh, lymphatic vessels in the skin as well as blood vessels, and antigens and microbes and can drain into the lymphatic uh, as well as into uh, the blood system, the bloodstream, via these vesicles. Uh, similar to the mucosal immune system, the cutaneous immune system has a, is facial and cell type driven, as I just showed you. Um, for example, uh, longer Han cells in the skin have an impaired in, in expression of different toll like receptors, which bind bacterially derived ligands, which and this may help prevent unwanted reactivity to commensal skin bacteria by, while maintaining antiviral responses. Um, there's a large variety of innate and adaptive immune cells in the skin, and transdermal <coughs> and delivery can also drain into the mucosal immune responses um, in the GI and genital tract. So there's huge amount of complexity again in the cutaneous immune system as there is in the mucosal immune system and a little bit of crosstalk between the cutaneous immune system and the mucosal immune system. Uh, it, two other very popular uh, routes of exposure are intravenous and intramuscular um, dosage, dosages. And these two routes of exposure are very different from the mucosal and cutaneous immune system in that uh, in, within IV or IM uh, injections, you are actually going into a sterile environment. So you don't have um, immediately all the complexity necessarily that you have in, or immune complexity that you have in the skin. Um, there are uh, proteolytic enzymes around, and then you will get uptake into peripheral lymphoid tissues. A uh, big difference for the IV root administration is the rapid dilution of any antigen. You can also have clearance through per first, pa first pass effects. And for um, therapeutic proteins, you might also have renal antigen clearance, depending on the size of the protein. So for the IV and IM, you may have um, a very different clearance routes and potentially less drainage into the lymphatics. 
so the is issue is that administering the same antigen by different routes can result in different types of immune responses because of the con differences in the context of the response. And now I'm going to go through some case studies that illustrate this. And in this one, it's a subcutaneous versus uh, intravenous administration of CPG oligo um, deoxynucleotide. And um, the CPG nucleus, uh, nucleus, uh, motifs are common for bacterial DNA. And um, there are toll-like receptors that actually recognize CP CPG motifs and can induce innate immunity. And um, in this particular study, they found that subcutaneous but not IV administration of CPG, CPG ODM um, in a variety of doses into hu healthy humans resulted in increased serum chemokines, increased serum um, C-reactive protein, and flu-like flu -like symptoms. So you can see that the, depending on the route of exposure, you induce different effects. Uh, in, in humans with the same antigen. Uh, and this study covers, is a case study in which um, uh, host cell proteins and DNA were co-administered with uh, therapeutic protein or muscle protein. And uh, what they did in this study is to um, use trace levels of lipopolysaccharide, LPS, and CPG ODN. Um, and they found that um, co-administration of LPS and ODN synergize to increase the anti-ovalbumin antibodies in an animal model. model. And when they used um, erythropoietin as the model antigen, what they found when they co-administered LPS uh, sub um, or trace levels of the LPS and ODN was that they synergized to um, cause long-lasting anemia to erythropoietin, and this is in a mouse model. Um, and so I think both of these, um, these studies in show that, um, that there's a great deal of complexity, again, in how the immune system is going to respond depending on the context of the administration of the drug. Um, and here's another case study um, of, with regards to um, responses to Leishmania uh, immunization in mice. And in this study, Bowsey mice were immunized either IP interperitoneally, IV, IM, or subcutaneously with l dobani and um, a membrane, um, either antigen-free or encapsulated in lipidome. And they found that the mice that were immunized either IP, that mice that were immunized IP and IV were protected against challenge infection and had um, IL-2, IL-2, and TH1 responses produced interferon gamma, IgG1A, IgG2, and had um, uh, DTH, delay type hypersensitivity responses. However, mice that were immunized IM or sub Q did not have these protective responses. Um, they also, these same, the mice that were all, uh, immunized sub Q or IM also had increased um, TGF beta production and no delay type hypersensitivity responses. Um, and they also found that if you inject an anti-TGF beta prior to subcutaneous immunization, um, you had, um, you did increase the protective response. So what you're seeing here is that the route of administration um, resulted in a different profile of host cell immunity, I mean, of host immunity um, that changed the nature of the immune response from protective to not protective. Um, and here's another case study um, where a uh, cholera toxin B subunit um, was used in an oral tolerance uh, uh, study. And here they roll, uh, provided oral administration of cholera toxin B subunit, and they conjugated it to various autoadjugens, um, uh, <coughs> and they found that it suppressed animal models of autoimmunity. And this involved induction of regulatory T cells by B cell dependent and B cell independent routes of administration, routes of antigen presentation. And what they postulated that um, CTB was taken up through um, uh, ganglified um, B cells, and re which resulted in TGF beta induction and IL 6 suppression, which was involved in tolerance induction. Uh, in contrast, another antigen, cholera holotoxin, um, and that, um, 
was also reported to inhibit oral, was reported to inhibit oral tolerance and induce um, IL-6 uh, and IL-1 theta. So again, we have this highly complex um, in a play it, that depends on the nature of the antigen and the cells that are responding to it. So here's a case study um, of inhaled versus subcutaneous insulin. And um, in this study, uh, this was actually a clinical trial with type 1 diabetics who were treated either with Exubera um, or with um, subcutaneous insulin. And the diabetics who were treated with Exubera had a 22% increase in the mean antibody percent antibody binding compared to patients receiving subcutaneous insulin. Um, the anti drug antibodies were also induced in type 2 di diabetics receiving Exubera, although peak antibody levels were lower than type 1 diabetes diabetics, and peak titers were achieved within 12 months. However, in this case, there was no association between the antibodies and whether the patients were hyper or hypoglycemic. Um, and then um, we have a case where hypersensitivity responses were induced by denatured or aggregated proteins. And um, so also the nature of the protein as well as the administration um, can impact uh, immunogenicity. And this is a case of intravenous immunoglobulin. And in these, in, with intravenous immunoglobulin, there was, um, or early preparation of intravenous immunoglobulin had substantial aggregate content content, which caused severe and what was called back then anaphylactoid responses. Um, product aggregate directly fix complement, um, and um, the antibodies were um, to aggregate specific determinants. Um, generation of immune responses to, to native determinants were only generated in patients who were Ig deficient. Uh, reduction in the level of aggregate in IVIG preparations has um, solved this problem. So I think what I've given you is um, probably a great big headache um, in now trying to figure out how your route of administration is going to impact the anti-drug antibody response. And while I didn't exactly want to give you a headache, I think uh, the overall answer is that you need to think very carefully about your route of administration and the context in which you're giving the drug as a whole in order to correctly understand what the likelihood is that you are going, that the route of administration is going to have a positive or negative impact on any drug antibody responses and um, how you're going to factor that into your risk, uh, your risk assessment and mitigation program. Uh, unwanted, wanted and unwanted immune response can be introduced by all routes of antigen exposure and uh, as as I said, understanding the immune system being challenged by drug delivery will help design products with desired anti-drug antibody profiles. I believe, um, oh, I have another point. Um, to reduce unwanted immunity, it is critical to control the adjuvant effects of products and process related impurities and excipients. And I think that's my last slide. So, um, Jeremy, I'm not sure how to, I think I can do that. Thank you very much, Susan. That's great. I'd uh, love to take some questions, if that's okay for you. Um, has anyone got any questions? And if you can come up to the front, Bonnie, so that Susan can see you and she can hear you as well, that'd be great. Is that Bonnie up? It is. She, you'll, you'll see her in a moment. Hi, Bonnie. Hi. Um, so, Susan, um, you gave a lot of good um, case studies in general, but a um, few of them were related to biotherapeutics, and, and the ones that were usually had pretty strong... Um, uh, other factors like you know large amounts of aggregation and so on. So what has the FDA um, seen in terms of um, say monoclonal antibodies that really are pretty well um, purified and so on in terms of especially um, subcutaneous administration? So I, I think I, what we've seen is some some very it's some variety and, and the reason you know most of my case studies um, were not directly related to, to therapy proteins except for perhaps with the, in, with the insulin is because there actually isn't a huge um, published literature on that. Uh, I think what we've seen is some variety. Uh, a lot of times 
Um, we have, I have not seen a great deal of difference between IV and sub-2 um, with the administration, but sometimes we have. Uh, I, it really has, to my mind, depended somewhat on the nature of the protein itself, uh, its intrinsic activity, uh, how long it stays in, in that subcutaneous space. Uh, I think it has a big impact on how immunogenic it's going to be. Um, so depot forms that last a while in that immunogenic, in, in the subcutaneous space, I think have higher likelihood of being immunogenic or seem to have a higher propensity to be immunogenic. And also, you know, one setting I really haven't talked about because it's not one, well, it's not one people think about a lot, uh, very much, but surgical settings where we've got therapeutic proteins introduced in the context of a surgical setting or wound healing, and you've got a hugely pro-inflammatory environment mm -hmm. there and even very short exposure times can, can cause the product to be really immunogenic. So I think the answer is it's been really complicated and dependent on a lot of other factors, not just the route of exposure. Was that happily dissati not satisfying? <laughs> Thank you, Susan. That's great. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? No, that's yes. Hi, Susan. This is a great talk. Um, so you mentioned about the difference uh, in uh, immunogenicity based on the um, mucosal immune system versus the other system, and mucosal being one of the uh, better ones. So in terms of wanted and unwanted uh, immune response, was there any differences among these different uh, route of administration? Is that, is that Again, between the mucosal, uh, mucosal and the uh, rest of the type of um, immunization uh, settings? Well, I think, I mean, mucosal routes of administration have a lot of other challenges. So you, you may um, get some desired immune effects, although I don't think that's, that's always true. Um, if you're treating mucosal diseases like IBD, then I think, you know, that could be a very good route of exposure. One problem with mucosal administration is if, if you want this to be a, um, a systemic uh, drug, then it has to get out of that environment, and that can be a big challenge for drug development. The other thing I really didn't talk about was Ig um, isotypes and the different isotypes um, through the different routes of exposure. Of course, mucosal exposure gives you IgA. Um, sometimes you will get systemic IgG, and sometimes um, you may not. Um, the IgA tends to circulate back into the mucosal environment. Um, so um, depending on the route of exposure, you may get a little bit more systemic IgA. So I don't think we can make a really uh, um, clear, define like what's better, what's worse. Um, you, you know, if your route of administration is inhaled, again, that's another mucosal route, but you have all the, tr the challenges of getting the right size particle into the lung in which depth of the, um, of the respiratory system you're going to get your drug into. So I think, you know, there are just no easy answers here about the interplay in general drug development um, and, you know, the considerations of wanted and unwanted immunogenicity. Um, so while I think, you know, you may certainly still believe that um, at least all routes of exposure may lead to reduce unwanted immunogenicity, there are a lot of challenges for actually delivering the therapeutic through that route of exposure. Yeah, I was also more thinking about the lung uh, route that you know, usually you get a uh, little bit of less inflammation because of the innate immune proteins present in those uh, airways. You know, that's what I was thinking whether that had any differences in the unwanted versus wanted uh, immune response. But I guess if there's no clear data yet, uh, that need to be looked at. Right, so, so I mean, with vaccines and stuff, you, you know, we look, I look a lot into the, to sort of the vaccine world to try and find information, because that's at least where you're trying to get wanted Im immunogenicity to these. And, and it's not entirely clear cut um, how well, you know, um, that the lung is better or not better. You can certainly get immune responses to the lungs. And with the inhaled uh, insulin, you got anti drug antibodies, but they didn't really have an impact. Um, again, I think um, the issue with the lung is not just unwanted immunogenicity or wanted immunogenicity. It's, it's quite a challenge to, de to deliver drugs into the right 
uh, region of the lung for absorption so, um, and, and have the drug be stable through the whole aerosolization or nebulization process to get it into the lung. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure, you know, it's not been a hugely popular um, route of exposure for things that are not destined for the lungs, and I think that's been less because of the immunogenicity and more because of the other challenges to um, um, inhaled administration and product stability and getting, getting a good dosage uh, into the lung. So in the literature, when I looked at that, most people stopped developing therapeutics for, for pulmonary delivery because um, the absorption was so poor, poor uh, and they couldn't get it where they wanted it to go. All right, thank you. Uh, sorry, I have no further questions. Uh, so thank you very much, we really appreciate you joining us today. And uh, just have a good rest of the day. I'm sorry you can't join us now for coffee, because uh, that's what's happening next. So um, again... I'll go buy myself a cup downstairs. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, it's a bit of fun to come otherwise. So, so again, thank you very much for joining us, Susan. Okay, and, uh, thanks. And we appreciate it. Bye-bye.